the SABC uh, can bring back its microphone. <laughs> But let me start by saying, uh, like our program director, uh, thank you to everybody for coming. I think the executive dean of the school did say that uh, normally we would have met in a smaller hall, but they got an indication that more people wanted to come. So well, welcome, welcome to everybody. I hope you you'd find the afternoon uh, worthwhile. I was very glad that uh, we allowed uh, for an explanation uh, of the school, what the school stands for, and what it tries to do. Uh, particularly, I think for the a new entrance to the school. I think the familiarity with the school uh, is an important part, I think, of, must be an important part of this afternoon. Uh, I, I think some of the challenges raised by my comrade president, uh, my fellow president, of the SRC are important. I think perhaps in the course of our discussion this afternoon we would come back specifically to the matters he raises concerning students and fees and, and things like that. Uh, now Temsila raised uh, started off by mentioning uh, uh, 30 years of democracy and then ask those all sorts of questions that are related to this. Uh, the matters that the NEO raised are also relevant to the same question about industrialization, ESCOM, and uh, manufacturing, and all of that. Let, let me start by saying, I think one of the things that worries me a great deal is that I think as a country, we don't understand South Africa in the same way. I think we carry in our heads different South Africans. Uh, and hence come with different solutions of what, whatever the challenges are. Uh, take this notion of 30 years of democracy. What has happened during these 30 years? I think one of the fascinating things about these 30 years is what has happened, differences in the different periods within these 30 years. There is a, a gentleman in South Africa, I'm quite sure that he's now fed up with me, because I keep quoting him. This is the, uh, the CEO of the Institute of Race Relations, and Dr. John Andres. Last year, Dr. Andres uh, gave a speech somewhere in the U.S. Uh, about the future of South Africa. I think all of us should read that speech. It's very interesting and very educative about 30 years of democracy in South Africa. And Dr. Andrews says this, that you can divide this history of 30 years into three ages. He calls it ages. as age one, age two, and age three. 
and says age one is from 1994 to 2007 and age two is from 2008 to 2022 and now we are drifting towards the conclusion of age three so Dr. Andres says if you look at age one The country is going up all the time. He says if even you take the number of people employed, in 1994 you got 8 million people employed. By 2008, it's 14 million. To contest this assertion that is made, that this was a period of jobless growth. Because in fact there's enormous job creation during this period. Levels of unemployment drop during this period. Um, the all manner of positive things. He gives all the detailed socio-economic figures to show this upward process. That's what he calls age number one. Then as I was saying, he says age number two is from 2008 to 2022. And you have the direct opposite happens. So in these 30 years of democracy, we start off going this way, and from 2008 we start going the opposite direction. So next time you hear somebody saying, uh, uh, you've had this terrible 30 years of democracy, they are not, not telling the truth. They are not... Uh, they are not uh, they are not talking about South Africa, they are talking about another country. Um, and you can see why, one of the reasons, why from 2008, some of the socio-economic figures point downwards. Because <coughs> I'm sure all of us will remember that 2008, 2007, 2008, 2009, was this period of the global financial crisis. Started with the crisis in the U.S. banks. Uh, affected the whole world. Impacted on us here. During that period, job losses started happening. This is an exogenous impact on South Africa. Of the global economy. Which is shrinking and therefore, in terms of our exports and all of that, they get impacted upon by that. So I'm saying you can therefore see one of the reasons why from 2008, in terms of those socioeconomic figures, you would see a downward trend. But I don't think that is the entire explanation for this change. Because one of the puzzling things about this paradigm as explained by Dr. Andres is during age one, uh, the national government here is the ANC. During age two, national government is the same party. So question arises, what happened that the same party is able to lead the country in this very positive way during age one and lead the country in the opposite direction in terms of age two. That's a puzzle. That's a conundrum. If it was a change of party, another party took over, then we can explain it. But it's the same party. What happened?
So I'm saying when we talk about Tem Sile, about 30 years of democracy, I think this is part of what we've got to take on board. That what, what Andres is saying is correct. It's factually correct. One of the things that Andres does not discuss, because he was not discussing that particular issue, is that it's during this age one that we adopt our current constitution, 1996. And part of what happens during that first period is that we then put in place all the institutions that are required of this constitution. So whether you are talking constitutional court or, or public protector or the commission on gender, gender and so on, gender issue and so on. All of these institutions, including the laws and regulations, come during this period. So this is a period, age number one, according to Dr. Andres, not only of socio-economic progress, but also the very entrenchment, the definition of democracy in this country comes during this period. Challenges even with regard to that come during age number two. I think this is a distinction that we need to make. Even in the context of voting on the 29th of May, I think we need to understand that context in order to be able to know who are we voting for. Who are these people? Yeah. I am sure that uh, uh, all of us in this hall being very educated people I am sure all of us have read the report of the Nugent Commission on SARS Comrade President, I'm sure you've read it. <laughs> you remember, colleagues, that what happened was, again, we're back, back to this age one and age two. There was a certain period when the South African revenue was outperforming itself in terms of collections would always see this thing that uh, there would be a forecast to say that SARS will collect a billion rand this year. At the end of the financial year, you know, it's a billion plus. For a number of years, it was like this. And then during age two, it went the opposite direction. SARS started underperforming. So that raised the question, clearly there is something wrong. What, what is wrong? That's how the Nugent Commission uh, of Inquiry Judicial Commission was appointed by President Ramaphosa. To answer this question, what has gone wrong? Uh, I don't know if there's anybody here who would like to help me to say, what, what does the Commission say? I'm looking for a hand. Uh, the Nugent Commission says, obviously I'm summarizing, that some people took a decision to destroy the institution. Now, all of us will recall that what has happened during, the, for instance, the proceedings of the Zondo Commission. There's been a big focus on the matter of looting. For instance, the state corporations, whether it's uh, Danel or 
ESCOM or the Transnet and so on. A lot of looting. The Gupta brothers and all of that. In this case of SARS, there was no looting. This under the Nugent Commission says there were people who took a decision to destroy the institution. Now that, that's a very remarkable statement in my view. Because SARS is responsible for 95-98% of state revenues. You destroy SARS, you destroy the democratic state. And yet there were people who took a decision to do exactly that. So the new Gen Commission report, which I'm sure all of us have read, yeah, gives in, in great detail what is it that happened to destroy this institution. In reality, the alarm sounded by the underperformance in terms of revenues was because of the success of the program to destroy the institution. So in that sense, the people who had taken the de decision to destroy the institution, they also provided the key to alert all of us to say there's something that's going wrong which was what led to the formation of the Union Commission. Now, the, some of us, after reading the Union Commission report, one of the things that stood out was the absence of looting. Because here's the state agency, it collects all these billions of rand. And you would think that one of the thin targets that would be, would be to, to steal. No, the intention was not to steal. But to destroy the institution. I think that tells us something. How, how do we explain that? That there would be people who would deliberately set out to seek an outcome of that kind. These are obviously people who are hostile to the very existence of that democratic state. They don't want it to succeed. So they intervene. If we take away these revenues, it won't be able, possible for the state to succeed. I'm saying it must be that there are, there are people there, those people, were people who were, who didn't like our democracy and wanted something else. I think what the importance of that new gent Commission report is that it actually communicated a very important message which all of us in South Africa should understand. And exactly this central point that there were certain people in the country who deliberately set out to destroy this democratic state. Therefore, it's not everybody who celebrated 1994. There's certain that to some of our, our fellow citizens, 1994 represented a defeat. And they did not accept that it's going to be a defeat. So it was a temporary defeat for them, but they knew that in time we will win. The message I'm saying, colleagues, it stands out, it's very stark in the New Gen Commission report. But I know the majority of us in this room here are hearing what I'm saying as, as, new, as new news. 
Yeah. Fortunately, it's not fake news. And part of the reason you are hearing it as new news is because for some reason, which I can't understand, the content of that report has not been widely reported in our media. It hasn't. And the Zondo Commission continued, looked again at the SARS issue. They looked at the outcome of the New Zealand Commission of Inquiry on SARS, and they said, we agree with what that commission says and its outcomes. But we are going to look at the same question again because it's imperative in terms of our own mandate. And they did. The Zondo Commission looked at the SARS matter, continued, in fact, continued from a new gen that they left off. And now this is one of the extraordinary conclusions in the Zondo Commission report. That as, as that all of us know, the Zondo Commission report has been now in the public domain for what, two years or something. Yeah. The new gen one has been on the public domain since 2018. Yeah. And clearly all of us have read it, the new gen report. <laughs> and I'm quite sure all of us have read the Zondo Commission report. The Zondo Commission report, among its conclusions, on the SARS matter, says one of the people who played a leading role in the effort to destroy SARS was the President of the Republic of South Africa. That's a strange conclusion. Fortunately, I was not president at the time. <laughs> the Zondo Commission says, in terms of all of the evidence that we've received, one of the things that stands out is that the President of the Republic made certain that he was one of the leading people in terms of the SARS processes, and in terms of the ESCOM processes. It's in the Zondo Commission report, it's in the public domain. And yet again, we have this strange phenomenon. Comrade President, that what I'm now saying about what the Zondo Commission says about who was responsible for this attempt to destroy SARS includes the President of the Republic. That is new news. It isn't. The, uh, and of course you know who the President was. And it says so in black and white, Jacob Zuma was part of the leadership in the process of destroy science. <laughs> That's not my opinion. I'm telling you what the Zondo Commission says. I'm telling you what the Zondo Commission says. Now, that's a bit of a conundrum. Um, that you would have the President of the Republic of South Africa participating in a process to destroy the institution that gives him the means to govern. That's a kind of contradiction. It's a contradiction that then raises a question. Who indeed is this President? Because there is no way you are going to be able to square the circle that the President of the Republic of South Africa acts to destroy the South African Revenue Service. I 
said that the Zondo Commission is entirely wrong. Or we are dealing with somebody who is entirely wrong. Yeah. I'm saying, colleagues, that I think this is part of the process of the understanding of what Andres describes as age one and age two. And what happens during these two ages, which are opposite to each other. I think many of us in the room, are, perhaps with the exception of the panelists, are old enough to remember when we first had our first national power cut, when the country went blank because of ESCO, what is called load shedding, the national. The first time it happened was in January 2008. You remember that it, even the mines, the mines had to shut down for a whole week. Yeah. Again, apart from, from our panelists here, uh, the older people would remember that uh, at that time I was president. And the previous month of December 2007, either December or November 2007, I'd, I'd apologize publicly because that, that what had been happening is that you had uh, regional instances of load shedding. Yeah. So in November, December 2007, I apologized for that. I'm, so on behalf of the government, we apologize for this because it's a re the reason for it is because there are certain things the government should have done and did not do. We delayed and hence this apologies to the nation. I repeated that in the State of the Nation Address 2008. You can read it up. It's on the internet. So, National Power Cut, January 2008. Many, many years later, I read in the newspapers that uh, there's a report that has leaked which discusses the power failure of January 2008. And in reality, I was very wrong to apologize. Because what, what ESCOM did, what as the practice within ESCOM at the time, was that it had its own internal monitoring process about internal performance of the power stations. And the regulation was that each power station must have a minimum of 22 days, 22 days supply of coal immediately with it, uh, and not to go below that. So the internal monitoring system kept an eye on that. And already during December 2007, that monitoring system was telling the power station managers, you are running out of coal, replenish. And they didn't. What caused the power failure of January 2008 was the power stations ran out of coal. Because the power station coal managers at each station didn't respond to this alert from within this organization saying replenish. They didn't run out of coal. So you can't produce electricity in a coal fired power station without coal. I think I'm saying I saw this thing in a report in a newspaper. It was a leak. So naturally, as you'd imagine, I'm very interested in all of this. 
This was a leak from a, a report of a special investigation unit. There was an SIU that had been commissioned to study certain things at ESCO. That SIU reported to the president in 2017 and said what I'm saying. That the reason for the power failure in January 2008 was easily avoidable. Because all we needed to do was to replenish the coal supplies at the power stations. That's all. The SIU report says, but they didn't do it for whatever reason. That, that SIU report was never released publicly. To, the, to this day, it's still not been released. But I, as you would imagine, I, I have some friends in high places. <laughs> so I asked them, I said, look, I've read in the media that there is such an SIU report. And it's in the office of the president. Can I please get a copy? And they gave me a copy. And indeed, the report says what I've just said. Now, colleague, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm talk, talking, talk, talking too long. But I'm trying to talk about 30 years of democracy. The question was raised very legitimately about ESCOM. I'm saying the first national power failure at ESCOM had absolutely nothing to do with the narrative that is told. No, this was failure of government. This, no, it had nothing to do with failure of government. It was a deliberate decision from within the organization to produce that crisis. And one of the immediate consequences of that is, according to the procedures at ESCOM, they declared an emergency, and the emergency meant that... Uh, in terms of coal, for instance, you didn't have to put out tenders and all of that. You just go and buy coal where it is available. That immediately doubled the price of coal. Immediately. And that report will also say some of those station managers pocketed something from that. I'm giving you, colleagues, an instance of part of what has been happening. I'm saying the, what the Nugent Commission particularly alerted us to, that there were some people in this country who did not like this democracy and sought to act in a negative manner to weaken it. I'm talking about ESCOM. We take a decision, the government takes a decision, decision in 2004. Whereas we had been saying to ESCOM, look, don't build new capacity, generating capacity, for a number of reasons. We changed that and said, 2004, okay, please build. That's when the decision was made to build Kusile, Medupi, Ingola. These power stations. 2004. But the record will tell you that the construction of Midupi, the first one, the first one to go under construction, started in 2007. So the question that arises in my head. What's the delay? Decision takes get taken in 2004. Implementation starts three years later. Why? It's not easy to find an answer to that question in terms of the ESCOM reports that we see on the internet. 
But the reason is, in fact, let me say the reason. What happened was that they started to construct Midupi before 2007. Not surprising when the government says 2004, please build. But they had to stop the building, destroy what they had constructed, because the companies that were paid and commissioned to prepare the building site for the building of Midupi didn't do their work properly. It's called geotechnical work. They didn't do their work properly. The result of which is when the construction of Midupi started, it sank. It had to be destroyed. More work done on the site. That delayed the construction of Midupi for two years. In my view, that's not an accident. That you'd have companies which normally are paid, they do this job all the time to prepare sites for construction of whatever, and they mess this one up so badly that it, decides, it delays construction of Midubi by two years. I'm saying I don't think that was an accident. is consistent with these people who intervened with regard to SARS. They were intervening with regard to the matter of electricity. Midupi, Kusile, were supposed to have been completed by 2014. In which case there would never have been this electricity crisis. But Kusile is still not completed to this day. Why? Seven years after the uh, uh, construction of uh, Kusile started, seven years, it was not generating any, whatever you call that unit, of electricity after seven years. Obviously, this is very embarrassing to anybody. So what ESCOM did was to hire an Indian company, the Tata Brothers. Hired the Tata Brothers to come and build Unit 1 of Kusil. And the reason they did that is because that company had built another power station in India which was more or less a replica of Kusil. So they came indeed and they, they built Unit 1 of Kusil. So at last Kusil was generating electricity. So this company was expecting that uh, their contract would then be extended to build Unit 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But ESCOM said to them, no, we can't extend your contract unless you have got a BEE partner. So the Indians wanted to know, we brought 50 engineers and technicians from India, and the rest of the staff is staff at ESCOM that we worked with. When you say we must have a BEE partner, how do you do that? Are there black engineers and technicians who can then come and become our partners? Maybe that's black empowerment. No, that wasn't working because already they had 120, 130 people under mentorship, engineers. Well, in the end, the matter couldn't be resolved of this BEE partner, so the Indians left. They finished their work in 2016. 
That unit one of uh, Kusile was integrated in the grid in 2017. I'm saying to, do, to, to this day, we have not finished completing, constructing Kusile. And yet it's quite clear, if this business had not popped up of a BEE partner, Kusile would have been completed long time ago. And I'm, I'm absolutely certain that whoever said to these Indians, get a BEE partner, it was not of, out of interest in terms of BEE matters. It was to delay the construction of Kusil. So colleagues, I think you know, you can see where I'm going. Yeah. In 1994, we... Uh, In our assessment of the situation in the country, we said, uh, I'm talking now about the ANC, we said it's obvious that uh, not everybody in South Africa will be happy with the change that is taking place. Therefore, it's inevitable, it's inevitable that there will be an attempt at counter-revolution. It's inevitable. And we thought that attempt would come via violence, there would be bombings and be assassination of people and all that. And indeed, we were quite correct, that's what happened. I think you'd, call, you'd, you'd recall the people got arrested, then the Puremach and all that. Uh, I don't know if they are out of jail now, which set off some bombs and so on. And in a sense, when the security forces succeeded to do that, yeah. our understanding was that, well, this counter-revolution that we feared, in fact, has been dealt with. And we were quite wrong. You will see, I'm sure, all of you, again, educated people, there's quite a lot of discussion in the media about what is meant by the National Democratic Revolution. And a lot of opinion here that this is a program that was decided by Lenin in Russia many years ago. It's a communist program and it's stage one towards socialism. You find like, a lot of that discussion. Yeah. And that's part of the thinking that informed the counter-revolution. But in this ANC, what is this ANC? This ANC is nothing but a proxy of Moscow. It's a communist front. What it wants to do with South Africa is to reproduce that socialism following the stage one of the National Democratic Revolution. So we must defeat it by all means. I'm talking about the thinking, the ideology between this counter-revolutionary intervention. So what I'm saying, colleagues, in the end, in order to understand this age number two, according to Dr. Andres, where you then have all of these negatives. None of them are accidental. You cannot have an ANC government performing as it did during age number one, and suddenly, in age two, it behaves in the opposite direction. There's been a change somewhere. And that change includes the change in the leadership of the ANC. So, when we're talking about, therefore, what is to be done? Tim Siller said, this ANC breakaways, uh, coalition politics, and all, what do we do about all of that? I'm saying, in that context of what's been happening in the country, how do we understand the breakaways? 
Or just take, take the MK party. You, you can't say, you can't say, I, remember, I remain a member of the ANC, but I support a party which is going to campaign to defeat the ANC. That doesn't make sense. One of those two things is wrong. So in terms of this breakaways from the ANC, take, take that breakaway. Uh, you can understand that. Uh, it is led by the same people who tried to destroy SARS. It is so, exactly the same people. This is exactly the same people. So you can understand who they are. Uh, Or even take the youth. Yeah. Take the youth league of the ANC. Quite affected by all of this. At some point you have an ANC youth league. Which has got its own political platform. Separate, different from the political platform of the ANC. It can't be ANC Youth League, it must be somebody else's Youth League. What happened? Suddenly you've got, uh, you know, the uh, very popular thing. I think even my com comrade president here referred to about land. Yeah. There's established ANC policy, which is in the Freedom Charter. If you come to me to say, now let's deal to something about the land, I'd say, bear in mind what we've said in that Freedom Charter for many decades. The land shall be shared among those who work it. That is a very well thought out position strategic position with regard to solving a number of issues here. The national question, the land question, how to handle it. You know, somebody pops up. No, 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 no. Let's take the land and give it to our people. So I say, me, I belong to the ANC. Who, according to the ANC in South Africa, is not our people? There's nobody who's got our people. That's ANC policy. Somebody else's policy might be very different. But that's why the ANC says this, land shall be shared among those who work it. Black and white and whoever they are. But I'm saying you have a, a youth league which is called an ANC youth league which has got a very different policy from the ANC on this matter. Is it ANC? It's not. It's a youth league, sure, but a youth league of somewhere else. Uh, I'm trying to indicate, colleagues, what has happened which has produced these two ages that Dr. Andres talks about, age number one where everything is going this way and age number two when things are going the other direction. Under the same political party. So, I think uh, in, terms of, in terms of our response to all of these challenges about coalitions and so on, uh, the question that we must ask, where do we want South Africa to be? Not where do we want the political parties to be, where do we want South Africa to be? In terms of employment, in terms of everything that we talked about, industrialization and so on. And who will get us there? 
You will read all of the election manifestos, all of them, without exception. That's all of them say, we will get you there. Whom do you believe? I think there's a major political struggle that has to take place here, in part based on a proper understanding of the state of the nation. Not the state of the nation as we wish it to be, but that it actually is. You take these matters about industrialization, manufacturing, and so on. Leadership, comparison to China. Uh, the Johann Rupert, a very senior business person in the country, uh, did an interview a few years back, I think with Power FM, And Juan Rupert says something which I, I was very, very glad he said it. Uh, he's generally a very honest person. He speaks his mind. And he said there was a certain period. There was a certain period in the country, as he describes it, it's during this age one. We should have taken advantage of that situation to invest in the South African economy. We didn't. And the reason we didn't is because we were uncertain about its future. Now that's a very senior business leader in the country who says that. At some point we, I can think I can tell the story now, we talked to the government of China because uh, clothing and textiles here yeah, were suffering greatly because of imports from China. As you know, I was saying that you look around, all sorts of items of clothing are made in China. So we talked to the government of China to say, look, this industry of ours is dying because of imports from China. Please do something to stop this flow. Uh, I hope the Chinese government won't be angry with me for telling this story. They agreed. They said, all right. Uh, so they would intervene to re reduce the flow of the Chinese exports to South Africa in order to help South African clothing and Eastern Canada to survive. And then said something which was very, very interesting to me. They said, part of what we will do, we will help your companies to catch up in terms of technology. Because they have fallen way behind in terms of te technology in this sector. So that by the time we normalize the situation, they would have caught up with the rest of the world in terms of technological development. What had happened now, because of the thing that Ivan Rupert is talking about, of a great reluctance by a major part of the capitalist sector to invest in the South African economy, what had happened in the clothing and industry, in the clothing and in the textile and clothing sector was that level of investment that dropped that includes adoption of modern technologies it was part of this general phenomenon of what Kossad used to call an investment strike because in truth a great part of capital in this country was very uncertain about the future of the country this miracle that people talked about was too good to be true. One day there will be a big explosion. Therefore, why invest? As part of the reason for the drop even in manufacturing. 
that was stage two, age two, when you have that phenomenon. During age one, you have a, a very different process of investments in this economy and so on. But suddenly it changes. So I'm saying to, an, to answer those questions about industrialization, uh, technological development, manufacturing, even leadership, you've got to discuss it within that context. Yeah. Because these questions never arose during age one. There's no questions about leadership, about this and that and the other, because things were working. This, it must as arise, our questions arise now because things are going the other way. And that's a challenge we face as South Africans to grapple with this reality which has impacted in all elements of national life. You go, can go through each one of the state corporations. ESCOM, Danel, Transnet, what has happened to all of them? And what has happened to all of them is not accidental. It's particular interventions to make sure that this democracy doesn't work. One of the interesting phenomena in West Africa, well, let me not necessarily, let me stay in West Africa, but say something else. You know, there will be a, a I think somebody mentioned this earlier, there will be elections in Senegal later this month, the presidential elections. Now, what had happened uh, in Senegal was that uh, over the last two years or so, uh, the most popular person in terms of the opposition he had got into trouble, got arrested and charged and so on. In the, in the end, I think he got charged for something, found guilty on the charge of corrupting the youth, uh, something like that. Sentenced. Uh, by far the most popular politician, I'm talking about a gentleman called Usman Sonko. Yeah. So that is in jail. And people were killed in Senegal demonstrating against his arrest and imprisonment. Genuinely popular figure. So, uh, because of this concern about democracy on the continent, and Senegal stands out on the continent as the one of the few countries on the continent which has never had a military coup. Since independence in 1960, there's never been a coup there. You'd have elections and then the company parties lose elections and new ones take over. But there was a crisis now because here is the most popular leader who's opposite side of the president in another party, but is in jail. So, uh, so we engaged, we engaged with President, President Makisal to say, but President, uh, Senegal is very, very important on the continent as this great exemplar, exemplar of democracy. It illustrates very, very firmly, very conclusively that we as Africans know how to manage democratic systems. And we can't afford to have Senegal fall back on that. And therefore, let the matter of Usman Songo, who wants to run for president, let that matter be decided by the voters, not by prison orders. Yeah. And just before I came here, I saw a lovely report that President Makisal has intervened, uh, declared an amnesty all the prisoners out of jail, including Usman Sonko. Uh, <clears throat> and pardoned various charges, as a result of which Usman Sonko is running for president. 
That was uh, <coughs> an excellent intervention made by the President of Senegal. Precisely to say it's, it's a responsibility of the Senegalese or the rest of us to defend this democracy, particularly, you raised quite correctly, in the context of the military takeovers that have been taking place, particularly in West Africa. But I think we've got to understand this about the West Africa situation. You know, uh, a few years back, you remember, we had to work with, the, uh, with Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire to help them to get sorted out. And one of the things that we found was that there was an agreement with France signed at the point of the independence of Cote d'Ivoire that France would maintain a military barracks in Abidjan, the capital. And the commander of the French troops, in any situation where he felt the security of Côte d'Ivoire or the security of France was threatened, he had the power, sovereign power, a French general, to take over the public station broadcasting and announce whatever he liked. It's one of the agreements, one of the 12 or so agreements that not only Côte d'Ivoire but many countries of the Francophone, the Francophone countries that signed with France at independence. Mali, Mali just now, has just repudiated all of those agreements. I think there were 11 or 12 of them. Which include prescriptions about when you've generated a foreign currency, bank it in Paris. Yeah. And Paris, the French franc then, would guarantee your currency, CFA. Part of what is happening uh, in, uh, in West Africa, Palisa, as you can see, is a rebellion by young officers against French neocolonialism. It's not only military coups to remove uh, some elected president. But these young soldiers are saying, our politics since independence has respected this junior relationship with France. That must end. So you see the big confrontation between these countries and France. It has to do with ending, the, like the agreements I've talked about. That you'd have a French general based in Côte d'Ivoire was actually the power to intervene in Côte d'Ivoire as he liked. So it's, it's an anti-neocolonial rebellion. It has got this element, you are quite correct, of uh, removing elected presidents. How does the continent deal with that? Well, you know the OAU has a standard policy, as you, as you mentioned uh, against illegal changes of government. So, the military governments don't get recognized. But we have a particular consequence now where Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso decide that they are walking out of ECOWAS. Now that can be a positive development. What is to be done? It's not a question that we can answer here. But I think, again, I'm trying to say, it's necessary for us to understand the objective reality. What actually is happening? It's not just young soldiers who are hungry for power and therefore remove this elected president. No. That's why they talk about Thomas Sankar. Sankara took power by coup d'etat. He was a soldier. 
But Sankara understood this particular issue, the need to destroy, destroy and defeat neocolonialism. And that's what these young soldiers are saying. What do we do with them? What does Africa do with them? I think Africa is an, an, a challenge, a problem, answering that issue, answering that question. Uh, again, you see, with regard to these issues of uh, our need properly to understand what are we dealing with. Relate, for instance, to the matter you mentioned, Palisa, of uh, the situation in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. That conflict. I'm, I'm, I'll repeat myself what I've said publicly. That the Congo, like all of us, we inherited colonial boundaries. And when the colonialists drew up the boundaries of the Democratic Republic of Congo, they included in the eastern parts of the Congo populations that were in Rwanda speaking. These are Congolese in terms of those colonial borders. But the problem for us and problem for the Congolese is that certainly even during the days of Mobutu, they did not, did not want to recognize the Rwandese who were Congolese as Congolese. You even had a formation there in the Eastern Congo of a military group, a militia, which was called the Mai Mai. The Mai Mai, whose, whose, whose purpose was to drive away these Rwandans back to Rwanda. And Mobutu was encouraging that. That problem persists to this day. As you know, the Congo, the DRC, is a very big country. And one of the challenges since the return of democracy, which was there before, it repasses, is the footprint of the government from Kinshasa is not necessarily strong everywhere in the country. So in the Kivus, this is part of the con problem, in the Kivus in the Far East, that's why you have the M23. Is because the Rwandan people, the Banyamulenge in Eastern Congo, have for many decades felt this, that they don't have the protection of the government in Kinshasa. So they need to protect themselves. In addition, you've had this challenge uh, of the people who committed the genocide in Rwanda, then they ran away into the Eastern Congo. So they are also there. Some of them involved in all sorts of schemes and naturally to try and overthrow the government in Rwanda. I am saying that the, the, the first, my view, is the first part in terms of dealing with the crisis in the Eastern Congo is recognizes that the Banyamulenge are Congolese. The Rwandan-speaking section of the population of the Congo is Congolese. And therefore must be protected by the government of the Congo like all the population of the Congo is entitled to protection by the government. That's a starting point. And then this issue has to be dealt with. Then what about the interests of Rwanda in the Eastern Congo about the Rwandans? this group that con con committed the suicide, genocide, as well as these Rwandan-speaking people. How do you regulate that relationship? But I'm saying the principal responsibility falls on the government of, of the Congo to protect 
the Rwandan-speaking population of the Eastern Congo of the Kivus. I think an understanding of those issues, why the coups data in West Africa, why this commotion in the Congo, we must, fortunately we are, as members of this particular school, as it was explained, we must be the first ones to understand the objective reality. What is the reality we are dealing with? Not necessarily to be, by, to be bought by slogans. It's popular sayings. Because they are popular, therefore they must be true. That's not necessarily correct. The illicit financial flows that Jonathan raised uh, in our study of the issue, we were saying that we found that the principal culprits with regard to the international uh, financial flows, outflows from Africa, for instance, were the corporations. It's the major companies that are responsible. And when those uh, monies get out of the continent, they end up somewhere in the developed world, including in these areas called tax havens. And therefore we said, even in our report, therefore the struggle against international financial flows, you can't localize it. Yes, as Africans we suffer from this problem, but you can't resolve it entirely just by interventions in Africa. You've got to also intervene in those countries which receive those outflows. I'm very, very happy that in the end, what has happened now is that at last, finally, the rest of the world responded to that as a consequence of which there is now a process at the United Nations, there's a process at the United, approved by the General Assembly, to, to prepare a draft international convention, tax convention, to deal with this matter of illicit financial flows, so that you can deal with it comprehensively, not, not regionally, but comprehensively globally. And the United Nations is now in the process of drawing that international tax convention which will deal with this matter. What is required in the, in the continent is to build, the first of all, the understanding of the issue and the necessary capacity. The necessary capacities, even in our tax authorities, to understand, to understand this. Um, when we were preparing the report, for instance, we went to Nigeria, we went to the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, we went to Mozambique, we came here, number of countries. And so we get to Nigeria, and one of the things we find, we're told by the Nigerians, it's not the customs service in Nigeria which measures how much oil is produced and exported from Nigeria. That's a matter that is decided in the office of the president. And because the office of the president does not have the capacities that customs have, they are dependent on what the oil companies report. And they were saying to us that uh, their own view, customs, was that uh, it's likely that the country was operating on the basis of an underestimate of a third, an underestimate of a third of the oil that was being exported. We go to the Congo, uh, and the Congolese say, we don't, actually don't know how much copper we are exporting. We are dependent on the, copper com on the mining companies to tell us. Mozambique same, uh, got this 
fishing trawlers who fish for prawns and all this. What is the catch of the prawns? How much of it is exported? Entirely dependent on the report of the fishing companies. I think that's just an indication I'm saying of the capacity. We need to build up the capacity within our countries to be able to do that in order to, to get a handle on this matter of illicit financial flows. Or take a last example I will give here. South African company gets, reg gets itself registered in Switzerland. And in the books, it is owned by, it's owned in Switzerland. So it exports money from here because they are paying the owner who is in Switzerland. And the owner is not at all a Swiss. It's two young officials from their company here. They post them in, in, in Zurich. They put a label in a room. This is company so and so. And they exported something like two billion dollars, like that. These illicit financial flows out of here. Unfortunately, the our tax authorities here managed to get a handle of that, and working with the Swiss and the British, they managed to recover that money. But this was entirely because of the capacity that there was in SARS to track down a, a, a crooked exchange of that kind. But I'm saying, uh, Jonathan, that. Uh, the matter of illicit financial flows remains with us. It's a very serious issue, but fortunately, at last, the whole world is saying, okay, let's get together and deal with this matter, even via a tax law, which will be binding on all countries in the world. A very, very important state for, step forward. Now, uh, I think I've answered all the questions. Uh, so, <laughs> but in the end, to come back here at home, the matter was very important. Question was raised about leadership. Leadership. I am saying that in in our case. The first, first thing we've got to do about our leadership here is to get people to understand South Africa. I'm sure if you lined up uh, the leaders of these political parties who are contesting elections and you said to them, how many of you have read the Nugent Report? I doubt if there's any one of them. It's a very complex question, and uh, when you raise this, that there was some intervention that was made which results in this change. People take time to absorb that. Because it's too dramatic, I suppose. It's too... The last thing I would say is that uh, Dr. Andres says... Stage three, which is the end of this transformation process, it says you can see the signs of stage three already in stage two. So in the end, what you are going to get is a South Africa that is governed by the private sector and the NGOs with the states playing some minimal part. That's stage number three. Age number three. And he says you can see it happening already. Municipal councils can't fill potholes. The citizens collect themselves and they collect money and fill the potholes. Government can't give us electricity. The mining companies produce their own electricity. Policing is not effective, so I hire private security services. 
So he says gradually you can see this happening in the end. What we are going to have is a South Africa governed by the private sector and the NGOs. And the democratic state will be a tiny little role. What that means is the condition of the majority of the poor in this country won't change. Because the private sector is not about to care about that majority. You need a strong democratic state to take care of this matter of inequality. But they say, he says, you can see it's disappearing, the democratic state. And that's where we are going. What do we do about all of those challenges? Those questions will not be answered by the elections. They must be answered by something else. What that something else is, I don't know. But thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Wow. I guess we, we have engaged. Our thoughts are still reeling and working hard to think about all this information that we, we just uh, received at this point in time. And this is information that you may not get in the books and that's why these conversations are so important, are so important. You may not be able to get them. And I think one of the things that really uh, touched me is when the president was talking about 1994 uh, as a, a defeat and now, uh, and then those that we defeated are looking at us to say we're going to get them somewhere there. And age one, which was much more about fortifying our democracy and when we see uh, age two the government as well being a player in the destruction of our democracy and I think these are very very uh, touching points when we think about our, our country and where we are uh, uh, today and uh, at this point I'm going to give our panelists one parting shot and open for the floor uh, I think we will be done in at half past, as, 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 as suggested. So, Tembisile, do you have something uh, that you would like to say uh, f uh, before you, you leave? Um, definitely, definitely. I think uh, before just a uh, short comment, uh, Program Director, I think what, um, li listening to all the questions from the panelists, uh, it took me back to what Mr. Lazuelo was saying when um, he overheard the discussion from the two professors. Um, <laughs> I guess we know the answer is everything. President Beck is everything. <laughs> he encompasses all of that. Uh, my parting shot, President, I took a lot from um, this, this, this session, and thank you very much. I believe that um, the takeaway mostly was your question of who will take us there. I think that is one very prominent question that we as South Africa need to ask ourselves especially because we've got um, elections coming up on the 29th of April, so end of May, my apologies. And um, this is a question that everyone here in this room, um, everyone here watching online and everyone um, in South Africa that's going to vote president need to ask themselves in order to ascertain who to vote for and where they see our country moving forward. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle? Thank you so much. I appreciate how you have broken down the last 30 years into three different dispensations and just to get an overall understanding of how we got to where we are at this moment. And I think my parting short speaks to, to, for me, everything rises and falls on leadership. And I hope as Africans and as South Africans, we can really make a conscious decision about who we elect into power and not just politicians, but thought leaders. Thank you. Alisa? 
Thank you very much, Program Director, um, His Excellency. Thanks for the response. I, I, I quite appreciate the fact that uh, when we are looking at the developments in the continent and juxtaposing them to what is happening here at home, it very much brings us closer to that H3 that might look something like uh, institutions when they begin to erode what is the position of a citizen in that process. And hence, I, I, I would like going forward for us to think about means of involving or driving a citizen-centric democracy, so citizens that are conscious and being able to uh, participate actively in the democracy without only seeing elections as part of the democracy. Thanks. Thank you, Fali I think the President also underscored a very important point around the fight in the West, uh, the military coup being an anti-neocolonialism yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. So I think, yes, definitely the coup and the bad coup. All right. Okay, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. I'm sure you can all agree it's been an, uh, an intellectually stimulating event. And there's just one thing I want to say before everyone goes. Um, when you're at the voting stations and you're staring at the, that sheet of voting paper, uh, please just remember one thing. Remember the party that brought you your freedom. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, at this point in time, I'm going to ask our panelists, can we give them the last round as they go to their seats? As you go to their seats. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, uh, now is your turn. And <laughs> I don't know if uh, there's people with mics to assist me. Anyway, now is your turn and we have very limited time, as you can see. Yes, five minutes. <laughs> Let's wait for the program. Oh yes, I'm taking five questions, yes. All right. I thought you say five minutes and I'm like, hey, how am I going to do five minutes? Uh, hey, there's, there's so many hands. I'm going to make sure that this side is represented, this side and this side and that side, all the five. Okay? Yes. A gentleman there? Oh, I don't see you, Mama. I was seeing her. <laughs> Sorry? Let's try to get you into the question. Go here. Thank you, Chairperson and the President, for an informative session. Um, looking back to history, uh, the first year of democracy, uh, South Africa managed to come out of economic meltdown because of the good economic policies that we had. I just want to find out where did we 
uh, drop the ball. And then going to the upcoming election, do you think that the current ANC can assist us to revive what we had? Thank you. There's a hand here. Good afternoon, Mr. President. I don't know if you remember me from a long time ago. It's Tim Duplessis. I'm a journalist. Tim. But my question is, Mr. President, it was wonderful to listen to you this afternoon, reflecting backwards and a little bit forward as well. About yourself and your remarkable political career, you've been president of the ANC for two terms, president of the country for two terms. What do you think you would have done differently Looking back now, is, is, is there something where you can say today, I should have done this, that, or the other? Thank you, Mr. President. Yes. Mr. President, thank you for a, a very interesting talk. Um, my question is, do you still dream of the African Renaissance? I see you here talking and there are a lot of problems, and especially in terms of problems of during your time as president. But what I'm not hearing from you, and current time as well, but what I'm not hearing for you, from you is your ideas on the future, on where you think we should be going, where would you like us to go? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ambassador, the Ambassador of Senegal is here. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Becky, and thank you, South African people. I just would like to attest that you played a key role in helping Senegal get out of this severe crisis. Among other leaders of the continent, you helped us, and that is something very, very important that we will never forget. I just wanted to make that statement to attest and to say that today Senegal is showing again that we are a strong democracy. We have strong institutions. We face this crisis, but we are getting out of it with the support of the continent, with the support of South Africa, and this is your support, President Becky. Thanks again. <laughs> Last question. This side? Yeah. The lady with the black, uh, black jersey. Yeah. Good day to you all. My name is Liza Maziba and I'm a first year student learning international relations here in this institution. Now you asked, you asked us to ask ourselves where do we want to see South Africa? And as the youth of South Africa, I'm a very op optimistic person and I see a South Africa where there's no tribalism, where there's no GBV, where where a student just, who just recently finished their matric does not, is not forced to take a gap year because universities are full. And where a woman over, or a man over 35 is unable to, to continue learning because NSFAS no longer funds them. But I have one question for you, sir, which is, what would you tell a person who's not as optimistic as I am about looking forward to in this country? Because it is not that easy for South Africans to be optimistic at this point. But what would you advise that person? What would you say to that person in order for them to see Africa or South Africa in your light. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. The President has missed your key question. Uh, that's why I was saying, let's get to the question. What is the question? You, you, my brother. The question, Your Excellency, is why is the African Union or SADAC does not use your expertise as a peacekeeping person? Especially that you've got cordial and brother relationships 
with President Kagame. We can capitalize on those relationships with President Kagame that I personally know that you have to try and help the situation in Kigali than being in, in DRC than being hostile. That's the question. <laughs> yes, the time. <laughs> You see, you see, look at the hands, look at the hands, look at the hands, and I'm being unfair to everyone. So let's allow the president to, if he allows us to take a second chance, I will do that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'll have to be very brief, no, like the, not like the last time. I want to say, first of all, thanks a lot to the Ambassador of Senegal. Because indeed, as she says, uh, I contacted her and said, Ambassador, please, here is a task. We need to speak to President Makisal because here is a challenge. And indeed, she actually responded, which is not normal, Ambassador, to actually said, I have delivered your message. Thanks a lot, Ambassador. <laughs> but really, I'm, I'm very, very proud of what President Makisal has done. I've worked with the President Makisal for quite a, long, quite a long time. So I was fairly confident when I spoke to him, I raised the matter with him to say, but here is a challenge, a common challenge we both of us understand. And this is how I think Senegal should behave. Uh, I'm really very, very proud of the manner in which he responded to that. The, the, uh, nobody has spoken to me about what to do about the DRC here at home. They haven't. I don't know why. But they haven't. Uh, next month, uh, Rwanda will be marking the 30th anniversary of the genocide. Uh, I, I, President Kagame has sent an invitation, I'll be going there, because I think for us, all of us as Africans, that that's an important anniversary to mark in order to address these issues about peace and stability on our continent. Um, in a sense, the, the issue about peace, uh, well, let me come at it differently. You would recall that uh, our colleagues in East Africa, this African community, decided to send a group into the Congo to help resolve the challenges in the Eastern Congo. It was led by President Uhuru Kenyatta. Now, he contacted me to say, I've been appointed in this thing. What do you think? So we discussed the matter. And indeed, I told him what I thought, that uh, the first challenge to really to overcome is to get the Congolese to understand that is a Congolese problem. It doesn't originate from outside of the Congo. You remember even when we had the negotiations with the Congolese, when they met here in Sun City to negotiate the transition to democracy and so on, one of the negotiating groups there was the RCD. And the RCD was an armed group. There were three armed groups. The RCD was one of them, which came out of the Kivus. Because of the population in the Kivus felt the need to defend itself. So it actually had an armed representative in the negotiations to negotiate the future of the Congo. As a reality that was understood by the Congolese themselves, they didn't say, RCD, you are not wanted here. So they were part of the solution. 
But I'm saying that I think the matter about this peace in the, uh, in the Eastern Kong, in the Eastern DRC, has become too factionalized. Because I saw somewhere on the television that uh, somebody asked one of the Congolese, but the East Africans came here and so on. Now we are getting the Southern Africans. What happened? And the response was, no, no, we don't want those. We didn't want those as East Africans because they, they were very deceitful. They didn't tell us that, in fact, they supported Rwanda. Therefore, we chased them away. I, I immediately understood what he meant. Because indeed, uh, uh, President Kenyatta, leading that East African group, engaging the Congolese government, raised this thing to say, but the Rwandans in the Eastern Congo are Congolese. You've got to treat them as, as, as Congolese. That was interpreted as, therefore, you are in support of Rwanda, go away. In a sense, you've got to find a way of depoliticizing the matter so that it can be dealt with objectively. Yeah. In the first instance by the African Union, which is facing its own challenges. What I was trying to say with regard to our economy here, yeah, and why it's performed differently, is not that one colleague was saying, why at what point did we drop the ball? We didn't drop any ball. As I say, you can, you can just look at the statistics yourself, do the research yourself, you're a university. Just look at what happened during this age one that Andres is talking about. The economy was performing very well. It was growing. Levels of investment in the economy were growing. Levels of numbers of people employed were growing. We, we even had... Uh, Something we're looking at with my colleague as we're coming here. There's a few years uh, where we actually had budget surpluses. And you have a budget surplus in order to generate resources, not to pay the money lenders, but to build schools and clinics and roads and so on. And the report says this was the first time since, 20, since 1913 that this country had budget surpluses for the very first time in an entire century. To generate the resources to be able to attend to the matter of the upliftment of our people. Instead of paying the bankers because you owe them too much money. We didn't drop the ball. But somebody else intervened to produce a negative result. Assisted by people within our ranks, who in fact were not part of us. They wore the same t shirts and. <clears throat> I think that uh, the, uh, this thing about optimism, starting here at home, you know the ANC has said in a number of conferences, uh, the ANC must renew itself, and it says for its own survival. It's a very, very important statement made by National Conference of the ANC. It's because those delegates understood what was going wrong. That something had happened to the quality of the membership of the ANC. Such that even the character of the ANC was changing. Because of what is happening to that membership. And they said, renew. In, for your own survival. That is an ANC decision. That challenge remains. But the point I'm raising it is because 
I think that's part of what drives my sense of confidence. There are still many people in the ANC who know very well that something's wrong. And therefore something needs to be done. And I identify the thing that is wrong correctly. And it's not difficult. It's been identified in successive conferences. I've seen documents prepared by our veterans which look at our ANC conferences since 1997. National conferences, NGCs, policy conferences. <coughs> and all of them up to date <coughs> say one thing. <coughs> and they say the quality of the membership of the ANC is declined. That since ANC became government, you had too many staff riders. People who came in because this was an opportunity to get a job in government and to steal and put something in your pocket. And they are there, members of the ANC wearing t ANC t-shirts. So when, when, when the membership itself says, we need to renew ourselves. It communicates a message that there is hope. That there are people there, ordinary members of the ANC, who are saying there's something wrong here. And I think that is a sentiment that would be shared by the generality of our population. If you went to the population and said, Dear population, look what we've done. We've removed all of the thieves who've been leading the branches of the ANC. They are all gone. The population would give you a standing ovation. I think that's what gives hope. If you look at, I talked earlier about what Kosato had described as a an investment strike. But a very, very interesting phenomenon is that during 2020, as the COVID-19 pandemic starts, the government puts out an economic reconstruction and renewal, whatever, economic plan. 2010. Business did the same thing. Its own plan for economic uh, renewal. Both of which were supposed to serve within the net lag process. So the business people surrendered their, they submitted their plan to government, which would bring it into the net lag process. And what I, I found really, truly remarkable in that business proposal was that business, well, let me say, start somewhere else. It was a meeting of the ANC where I say, I have read the, uh, the government recom economic report. It is 32 pages. I've read the business report. It's 132 pages. So I say it's clear to me that more work has been done by business in terms of what are the steps to be taken to really revive this economy. And the president, President Ramaphosa, at the end of that discussion said, well, Komitabo is correct. The business did they do their plan, but what he is wrong about is the length. He says 132 pages. In fact, it's a thousand pages, which illustrated exactly the point that business had done a lot of detailed work and said this plan we are proposing would cost three trillion rand over three years. We, as a, as, a, as a private sector, commit ourselves to spend a trillion rand. 
This was the very, very first time since 1994 that the private sector made a commitment of that kind. And a trillion rand over three years, they said a trillion rand over three years, and the end of the three years, of course, we'll do more planning. But that was a very, very serious commitment to help to create his factories and mines and this that we need. That's part of what gives me optimism. That clearly there's a change in the thinking of some of the business leaders so that they could make a commitment of that kind in writing. And that it's similar to the, we went to, a, we have my sister here who's sitting in the front row. She comes from the embassy of Guinea, Guinea Conakry. Uh, our last Africa Day lecture, that was Africa Day last year, was in Guinea Conakry. So she was our host uh, in Conakry. Uh, at the end of that lecture, part of what we did. Uh, was to address some of the universities around Conakry. And our lecturer, uh, himself a Guinean, said, uh, arising out of these discussions with these African students, the Guinean students, that it's, it's therefore absolutely imperative that we must work to, re to revive the African Renaissance movement. Because these young Guineans were saying, here are the ch changes that are facing us on the continent. And for that, in order to respond to these challenges, we need this Renaissance movement. And he promised that he was going to start immediately, to starting with those students in Conakry, to build that. That's why I'm saying, even about the Ren African Renaissance on the continent, I'm hopeful because the, the people, the masses of the people of our continent, still have that vision. I think part of what's happened at the point of the leadership, uh, there's been obviously a decline in the commitment to, to Pan-Africanism among our leadership across the board, that includes South Africa. There's been a reduction in that commitment that Pan-Africanist commitment. <coughs> and therefore a reduction in the focus on these issues about the African Renaissance, for instance. Yeah. Even now there is a discussion, the, the new commission, the Commission of the African Union, will be re-elected in January next year. So there's a hot discussion going on now about the processes for the election of that uh, AU Commission. And I think if you stay close enough to the AU, you would understand why that's a hot issue. Because you have these conflicts taking place on the continent, the conflicts in the Sahel. The conflict, the conflict in Sudan, Sudan is tearing itself apart. Uh, quarrel between now and today between Ethiopia and Somalia. Uh, the conflict in northern Mozambique, uh, or the eastern Congo, or Libya. And you look at those and you say, where is the AU? And ask anybody here to challenge you to say, this is what the AU is doing about this, that, and that. Nowhere to be seen. Something wrong there. But I'm saying that the sentiment among the young people, like the sentiment we picked up in Guinea Conakry uh, from the young people, was the importance of this renaissance and the need for them to reconstruct that movement so that this becomes an agent of change. I think that's what gives uh, hope. Uh, the 
to produce something different. Uh, here, I think, must start, as I was saying, with the understanding of our reality. Yeah. And my challenge to members of the ANC would be to say, very, very critical in terms of producing something different, is to do what the conference has said a genuine process of the renewal of the ANC. Part of what is problematic about it, that renewal, is I sitting in some senior position in the ANC. I'm not sure that I can survive the renewal process. It might identify me and say, this is one of the ones we don't want. So I will therefore block, I will block the process of renewal because it affects me personally. But I'm saying the challenge I would be made to the ANC is that let's implement what conference has said. This renewal. And you can't say it's now been possible to convene a branch of the ANC which has not held, we have not met for two, for two years. It's now meeting. Therefore, that's a renewal. It's not. Who are these people who are meeting? They may correct a million times, but who are they? Are they the same people who are busy destroying SARS? and are busy creating an ANC branch. I think something different will come from that process. And that would include to produce something different, really to implement what was commonly agreed in 2020, that the problems facing the country require all of us to join hands, that business, government, labor, civil society, let's work together. This social compact. With all of the work that was done, it was never achieved. And yet that is the only way to pull the country out of where it is. 70% of new investment in the South African economy, historically, has come from the private sector. You can't rely only on the public sector to regenerate this economy. Where the private sector produces 70% of new investment, you can't do without it. And where the private sector agreed, as it agreed in terms of the social compact, let's work together to define what is to be done. I think we didn't quite take advantage of that opportunity. That's one of the things that is outstanding, to do something different about this country, to produce that social compact. Indeed, uh, what our colleagues were saying, uh, we want a society where there's no tribalism, no gender-based violence, and, and, and all of these things gone. Even in terms of education. Uh, and part of the tragedy, part of the, our tragedy, in my view, is that in, in reality, as a country, we've got policies on all of these issues. I don't know of any issue where we don't have a good policy. Um, But something goes wrong somewhere. The policy remains policy. The practice is very different. Um, how do we cure that? Yeah. Issue of crime, for instance, is raised quite correctly. And the positions of the, the country 
the positions are correct. But something went wrong. For instance, the, you remember the, the ministry responsible for this was uh, the Minister of Safety and Security. And then at some point they changed it. It was Minister of Police. Uh, so we got a Minister of Police instead of Minister of Safety and Security. <laughs> and then uh, uh, you had National Commissioner of Police. Uh, provincial commissioners, inspectors, and this, that changed. They became generals and colonels and military ranks. I'm saying the policy to make sure that the citizens enjoy safety and security. The policies are there. But when you take this instrument and militarize it. And you begin to produce slogans like shoot to kill. That's what soldiers do, that's not what police do. Yeah. I'm saying the policies, I mean, many of these issues are there. We've got to attend to this matter. Where are the institutions? And therefore the people, the warm bodies, practically to make sure that these correct policies are implemented. That's a challenge. But thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you very much. We may be seated as the Dean is doing the vote of things. Colleagues, I think we've had a wonderful and highly educational experience. I want to thank President Mbeki the panelists for actually sharing their thoughts. Uh, Professor Meiwa, you are in charge of research at this institution of higher learning. What has come out of uh, the thoughts from the panelists and the response or responses from President Mbeki? These, these open up opportunities for very good research. Students were challenged to think out of the box, want to acquire a good education and pursue research which is meaningful. I'm not saying students should not be political animals, but they must also focus on research work because that's what also liberates the mind and liberates the country. To the ambassadors, Professor Mayua, I want to thank you very much. Your opening of the occasion was precise, short, sweet, and to the point. And that's how we want to see it happen. Ambassadors, high commissioners, representatives of embassies, we also thank you for being here. You have actually blessed with this occasion with your presence. I want to thank the organizers, or before I thank the organizers, the media. Your role is very important in society. If you project and allow for analysis and thinking, the role of the media also becomes part of the education process of a society and a continent. I want to thank you for being here, and your, that is your presence. Last but not least, 
the organizers of this, con of this conversation activity. You have done a fantastic job. I, the attendance is very good. Keep it up and, and improve even some more. Professor Paswana, you have chaired and steered this occasion in the right direction. Let's keep it that way. We'll have more of these. Now we have an opportunity to have, photo, to have photos taken. I want to ask the panelists to come to the front, come and take a photo with President Mbeki, and then I'll ask members of the Diplomatic Corps to also have an opportunity with the President. Thank you, thank you. Um, at this point in time, we have come to the end of our event, and we are going to request that we all get seated as the president is being taken away. Um, and then our student, current students of the TM School, please remain seated. The panelists, please remain seated. And obviously, the dignitaries that are here. And then as, as the person is being taken away, we can all leave. Please drive safely. Thank you for uh, uh, being with us this afternoon. We hope to see you again at the next event. Thank you very much and drive safely. <laughs>